well thank you uh, for coming uh, to this revision lecture on respiratory digestive and neurogenital anatomy um, I'm Remy I'm a fourth year um, interested in surgery so kind of like doing these anatomy uh, lectures for you guys but uh, disclaimer this is a quite large portion of your syllabus as you can imagine from your waist down to your I mean, sorry from your neck down to your waist so um, I tried to cover a, a lot of the basic stuff in your syllabus um, but there is some omissions uh, just because I'm trying to keep this to an hour so if I haven't covered something you would like to go just send me an email and I don't know I can answer some questions or we can do another due at a different time um, I've ha I've got a Socrative room with some questions for you. Um, if you join that that room, we can go through them as the presentation goes along. Um, just makes things a bit more interactive, I guess. Uh, but no worries if you don't want to do that. Uh, so, without further ado, uh, let's get started. So, to kick off, we're going to cover some thoracic anatomy. So, what is the thorax? Um, it's basically just a fancy word for the chest. Um, Generally, it's the area between uh, the bottom of the neck and the beginning of the abdomen. Um, so it's just the central portion um, of the trunk that we all have. Um, anatomically, the thorax is more well defined by the thoracic cage, um, the components of which I'll go through um, shortly. Uh, so the first question that I'd like you to think about um, or answer if you are joining this operative is uh, what is a true rib and how many do we have? Um, it does it does cover in your on your syllabus the difference between true and false ribs and also floating ribs. So um, just uh, an interesting thing to think about. Um, so let me see. I've got some answers here. Uh, right. So. The answer was D. Um, we have seven. We have seven true ribs, and the definition of a true rib is one that is directly attached to the sternum. So, if we look at this picture on the right here, the ribs connect the sternum uh, to the thoracic vertebrae. Um, but for the first seven ribs, this connection is direct. So, you see this uh, costal cartilage here, which directly bridges the anterior portion of the top six ribs to the sternum. Um, whereas from seven, rib seven to 12, you either have a indirect connection to the sternum via this sort of anastomosis of, of cartilage, or for ribs 11 and 12, uh, which are called the floating ribs, um, they don't attach to the sternum at all. Um, so yeah, that's just, that's just the difference between them, basically. Um, the purpose uh, of this rib cage, as you might expect, is to um, contain the uh, contents of the chest, which I'm sure you all know primarily would be the heart and the lungs, uh, but also some important vessels. Um, if we focus on the sternum, which is this midline bone, uh, it's got three main parts, the manubrium at the top, the body, uh, and that's where the uh, costal cartilage articulates. Um, so you can see there's seven notches and that's for the first seven uh, ribs, which are the direct um, true ribs. Um, and then at the bottom, you have this like, ziphoid process. Um, so pretty simple, just keep it to that three parts. Um, as I said, uh, functions of the thoracic cage include protecting the thoracic contents um, and they also assist with respiration, which I'll discuss shortly. Um, and just have a structural kind of function to hold up um, the upper extremities, i.e. the arms, shoulders, and our heads, which is quite important. Um, if we try and contextualize the ribcage, um, by that I mean, if we think about how the ribcage fits in in our overall sort of uh, surface anatomy, um, you can see that they extend, the ribs extend one through 12, um, they take quite a lot of space up on our torso um, with a sort of uh, elevation towards the xiphoid process in the midline. Um, so yeah, the rib cage is quite a big structure. Um, even the sternum, as you can see, takes up a fairly big portion of our upper chest. Um, on the right, you can see here the heart um, where it would sit underneath the rib cage, uh, which is important to know uh, when you go into clinical because 
Uh, we use certain landmarks on the uh, chest to examine different parts of the heart. So as you can see here, um, when we use our stethoscopes to listen to the heart, which is called auscultation, um, one of the key areas we look at is uh, the fifth intercostal space along the midclavicular line. Um, so that's an easy question they could ask you as part of your part A's, uh, where would I find the apex beat? Um, and simply the fifth intercostal space is the fifth gap between successive ribs. So this would be the second intercostal space, third, fourth, fifth, and the midclavicular line is just midway between the clavicle. Um, so pretty simple, um, easy marks really. Um, these other regions are also correspond to where you could hear um, movement of blood through the valves most. So uh, the apex beat corresponds to where we hear the mitral valve behavior the most. Whereas for example, up here on the uh, right sternal edge is where we'd hear the aortic valve the most. When we talk about uh, the lungs, we should think about the lung fields. Um, generally, they um, correspond to different anatomical areas of the lungs, um, a lot of the time correlating with the different lobes. Um, just like in a, in a heart examination, when we're listening to the sounds, we want to go to certain places. Uh, with When we're listening to the lungs, we also want to go to um, certain important surface landmarks. Um, the apices are often forgotten because people don't realize that the tips of the lungs actually go above the clavicle. So when we do a respite exam, we want to put our stethoscope above the clavicles uh, to listen to breathing there. Um, elsewhere, we look at the superior lobes on each side, um, the middle lobe, of course, for the right but not left hand side, as I'll discuss. Um, and then we want to go towards the edges, which are called towards the axilla, which is sort of the midline of our armpit. Um, when we're listening to different lung regions, we're assessing uh, breath sounds, are there crackles, is there a wheeze, um, etc. Uh, it's just another picture showing the different lobes of the lung uh, on the front and the back side. Um, I'll, I'll just mention now, you can see that the right lung has three different lobes, um, whereas the left only has two. Um, in addition, the left has this cardiac notch where the heart sits, um, so just something to think about. And that's, you can see it here again, um, three, three lobes on the right, superior, middle and inferior, and then two on the left. Um, as well as this, you can see um, some differences between the left and right main bronchi or bronchus, uh, with the right being wider, straighter and shorter, uh, which if you just use some rationale there, you can realize if someone aspirates say a, a plastic toy, if a, ch a child aspirates plastic toy, um, it's more likely to go to the right just because it's more direct access um, into the right lung. Uh, where the trachea here divides is called the carina. Um, it's important anatomically for if, uh, for example, you're trying to get access into uh, someone's airway if their own has collapsed. Um, the lungs are covered by uh, pleura, which are just kind of uh, a double membrane um, around the surface. The parietal pl pleuro is the outermost uh, membrane, whereas the visceral is the innermost and the one that most directly adheres to the lung surface themselves. Um, the functional significance of these pleura is that um, sometimes there can be air between the visceral and parietal pleura, uh, which is called the pleural space, um, and air in the pleural space is uh, a pathology that I will cover very shortly, so keep tuned. When we talk about breathing, um, we need to think about the different components involved. Two of the main ones are the diaphragm and the intercostal muscles. There are also accessory muscles you might use, so if someone's having an asthma attack or has COPD, you might see how they sit forward with their arms raised, and that's because they're using their traps um, and also some other things to really try and squeeze as much air in as possible but mainly we're thinking about the diaphragm and the intercostals when we breathe in we see that this diaphragm which is kind of like just a, a curved uh sheet if you like um when we breathe in that curved sheet flattens out it contracts and that causes it to become straighter um and as it becomes flatter and straighter um there's more room in the uh, chest cavity uh, to allow the lungs to expand as the lungs expand, 
the pressure in them becomes more negative until it becomes less negative than the air pressure outside and obviously air follows that pressure gradient and moves in. Um, the opposite sequence happens when we breathe out, diaphragm relaxes, curls up a bit more, compresses the lungs, um, makes the pressure more positive inside the lung than outside in the air, and then air moves out. Pretty, pretty simple, but also something you should expect to be uh, examined on. So um, try to keep it on the, on the tip of your mind. Um, another important point is that C3, 4 and 5 keep the diaphragm alive. Very easy way of remembering uh, that diaphragm is innovated by C3, 4 and 5 uh, nerve roots. When we think about the intercostals, it's a bit slightly less uh, simple than the diaphragm because we have external and internal uh, intercostals which have slightly different roles. Um, as you can see here, uh, they kind of run in opposite directions um, with the externals on the outer edge and the internals more in, inside uh, with the innermost being uh, completely on the uh, posterior side of the ribs, whereas the other two sit in between. So the external intercostals are involved in forced and quiet inhalation. So forced inhalation is just, you know, taking a deep breath in, um, quite, you know, assured breath in, let's say. Um, whereas quiet breaths are those that tend to not involve the diaphragm as much. So if we take quite calm, very shallow breaths, it's the externals that are generally doing more of the work. Um, and they do they they allow this this inhalation by raising the ribs upwards um, and outwards, and thereby allowing the lungs more room to expand into. Uh, the internals, on the other hand, are involved in forced ex exhalation. So the diaphragm would be involved in this movement. Um, it would uh, curl up, uh, compress the lungs, and then to really help squeeze out that last remaining air, the internals would contract as well um, to bring the ribs back down and inward and therefore reduce the space of the chest in the chest cavity. When we think about chest expansion, we think of two axes, anterior posterior. Um, so if you're facing forward, we're thinking of the chest, your rib cage moving further away from you um, and lateral, which is moving to your left and right. Um, during inspiration, both of these dimensions increase, but the anterior posterior increase, so the increase in uh, chest cavity size in the forwards and backwards direction is greater than the increase in the lateral direction uh, for the upper chest. Um, and I'll show you why here. Um, there are two kinds of ways in which the chest can move. Um, so we describe them as the pump handle and the bucket handle. I'm sure someone might have mentioned this to you before. Um, for the pump handle, we're thinking about the anterior posterior direction. Um, as you can see here with this pump, it moves up and down in this one sort of axis. So there's no change in, in the distance sides to side. Um, whereas with the bucket handle is where we're really seeing that lateral expansion as the as we, if we think of a bucket with two handles and we lift both handles up, the distance between the side of each handle will become bigger. So um, it's the bucket handle movement that's responsible for lateral expansion. And I've just told you that the upper chest is more uh, prone to the AP, so forwards and backwards expansion rather than the lateral. And that is simply because uh, the higher ribs, so the ribs two to six, generally do more of a pump handle action than a bucket handle. Um, and that, that's that's basically it. Um, when we think about the thorax, uh, there are several reasons why it's important. Um, I've just included here two different pathologies that you can get um, that are mentioned in your syllabus. Um, here on your right is an X-ray, which we've just started to learn in fourth year, so I don't <laughs> don't expect any of you to necessarily know this, but um, on this x-ray there's there's an abnormality on the right side um you can see here on these ribs that they're kind of uh, cracked um it's a bit hard to tell but i think this one's the most obvious where there's a disconnection between two ribs um but more than a rib fracture this x-ray is showing something called a flail chest um, and it's where you have uh 
rib fracture in three or more contigu contiguous ribs. Contiguous just meaning one after the other. So if you imagine we have three ribs that are broken in a row, that's going to have more of a wide consequence on the whole chest wall movement. Um, and in fact, it leads to this whole segment becoming detached from the chest wall. Um, generally, it's caused by blunt, uh, brunt trauma or blunt trauma. Um, and is associated with other thoracic injuries like this next one, which I'll show you. Um, this is not actually, this example is not from um, a trauma case like would have caused the uh, flail chest, but it is a similar pathology that can be caused by flail chest. Um, it's, it's, it's even harder here, I would say, to really appreciate the pathology, um, but I've drawn these arrows on which, which I hope you can see define a boundary between where the lung markings are more consistent, uh, a bit lighter, um, and this sort of uh, darker area with no nothing in it. If we look on this side, um, I hope you see my cursors, if we look on the um, left side, you can kind of see patchiness or not patchiness, but whiteness, different lung markings throughout the whole um, throughout the whole lung, whereas here it kind of stops and then we see this line. And basically what that's showing is a, a collapsed lung um, or in other words, a pneumothorax. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, air can get between the visceral and parietal pleural layers into the pleural space. Um, and a pneumothorax is simply air in the pleural space. Um, so what you could see on the X-ray, that black line was simply the outline of the visceral um, membrane of the of the lung um, and that darkness outside of the line more lateral was just basically air empty empty space whereas on uh, the healthy side you generally see more lung markings all the way to the edge. Um, pneumothorax is quite interesting because they can be completely asymptomatic or they can be very severe uh, presenting with chest pain, uh, really bad dys dyspnea, so breathlessness um, and hemodynamic instability. So a uh, falling blood pressure, high heart rate. Um, so yeah, it, it's, it's quite a spectrum of severity. Um, generally, it can be caused by trauma. So the same thing that can cause your rib uh, to, to fracture could cause a pneumothorax if, for example, a rib pierced uh, your pleural uh, uh, pleural membrane um, can be iatrogenic. So if I tried to put a nasogastric tube uh, down your esophagus, but I missed and I went down your right bronchus, remember, because right is the shorter, straighter one, uh, that could also pierce through one of your pleura. Um, other than this, you have primary spontaneous, which is just, you know, it just happens, not really, people don't really understand why there's no sign of disease underlying uh, the pneumothorax and then secondary spontaneous is when um, there's there's no obvious immediate cause but there is signs of underlying lung disease which might have compromised the uh, pleural membrane um, yeah uh, so this is this is core uh, the pneumothorax but um, I suspect this tension pneumothorax is a bit um, extra if you're writing an essay on it but basically a tension pneumothorax can develop from uh, any type of pneumothorax. It's a medical emergency. Um, unlike a simple pneumothorax, the air, once it comes into the pleural space, doesn't have any way of escape. Um, and that generally leads to an increased pressure in your chest cavity. Um, and if we think about what else is there, you have your heart. Um, so it generally will compress the heart um, to a point it could cause cardiovascular collapse and even arrest. Um, so it really should be diagnosed quickly, clinically without imaging and treated as soon as possible with a needle decompression. Um, this is just a cartoon kind of showing um, in an open pneumothorax or a simple pneumothorax, as much as the air does go in and cause the lung to collapse, it also has a route of exit. So generally the pressures equalize, whereas in a tension pneumothorax, as only going in, uh, when you're breathing in, the air's coming in, when you're breathing out, the air is not leaving this pleural cavity. So over time, you're going to have uh, pressure on this, the, the mediastinum, uh, the heart, um, which is a big problem, or it can be. OK, so that was uh, somewhat of a whistle-stop tour through um, respiratory and thoracic anatomy. Um, if you have any questions, just put them in the chat, and we can address them at the end. Um, now I'm going to talk to you a bit about digestive anatomy. Um,
again, it's a quite broad um, collection of organs in the digestive tract, all the way from uh, the mouth, down the esophagus for the food pipe, into the stomach, uh, from the stomach to the duodenum, small intestine, all the way into the, the large intestine or the large bowel, across here, down to the rectum, and finally to the anus where we'll remove any feces or waste products that have collected through from the start of the journey. Um, ultimately, the digestive tract's main function is to introduce food into our bodies, which can be broken down and digested to release nutrients, which we can absorb and use to grow, use to heal, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but also to then process the waste products and excrete them um, in the most efficient way possible. So starting at the mouth, uh, also called the oral cavity, which I was, didn't actually realise <laughs> till I was making this slide. So it's also called the oral cavity in case they ask you about that in the exam rather than mouth. Um, you can see uh, this is from Teach Me Anatomy. It's just kind of simplified the mouth into uh, four or so main compartments. You have the vestibule, which is just the gap between uh, your lips and your teeth. Um, you have the hard and soft palate and you have the tongue and the oral cavity proper is the actual cavity so the lack of substance that you see in the mouth um the hard palate is is bony um it's found in the anterior two-thirds of the roof the mouth roof um, and it's involved in feeding and speech um the, the, its role in feeding is kind of related to its ability to create a vacuum in your mouth to uh, make sure the food's going in and are they not falling out while you're chewing or something like that? Um, meanwhile, the soft palate is, is obviously not bony as the name suggests, it's more muscular. Um, one of its key functions is uh, producing mucus to lubricate the cavity. Um, so it contains many mucus glands. Um, and it's also involved in swallowing and breathing as well, um, also in speech. Basically anything in the mouth is involved in speech um, and feeding eating is, is also a good bet to answer if you're, you can't think of a function of something. So when the palate fails to fuse, you might have heard of this condition, cleft palate. Um, so cleft palate and cleft lip really is what it's usually called because they most of the time uh, come together. Um, it's just Failure, failure of fusion of various embryo, embryological components, including the nasal septum or the lateral palatine processes. Um, it's managed in quite a complex way um, with, with some plastic surgery involvement, followed by uh, speech and language therapy if there is speech impediment, uh, which usually there, there could be. Um, so yeah, if you're writing an essay on uh, the mouth or, or whatever, this would be a good little thing to put in. Um, mastication is just chewing, it's the fancy word for chewing. Um, two major sort of components involved in this, uh, or, or bony components, I should say, and that's the mandible, which is the lower jaw, um, and the temporomandibular joint, uh, which is the uh, joint between the mandible and the temporal bone. Um, the joint is really what allows us to chew because um, Without that joint, you wouldn't be able to move your mandible. Without that, you wouldn't be able to chew anything. So they, they work in, in a team. So there's a second question here. Um, damage to which nerve would cause weakness in the muscles of mastication? Um, I'll just give you a minute if anyone wants to give some answers to that. So again, the muscles of mastication are simply the muscles involved in um chewing our food and stuff like that just give it 30 more seconds right so um the nerve involved in or the nerve that innovates the muscle of mastication is the trigeminal nerve. So well done um, for getting that right. Um, so, you know, it's quite simple. If you know that the trigeminal innovates these muscles, there's damage to the trigeminal, you're going to have uh, some issues with, with chewing up your food. Um, 
so these muscles are what uh, they exert um, or do work at the level of the TMJ, so the temporomandibular junction. Um, so by contracting and, and working in synchrony, uh, they can move the mandible along that joint uh, so that food is uh, chewed up and prepared for digestion. Um, the external muscles are the temporalis and the masseter. So if you clench your jaw, you'll feel both of them, or you should feel both of them bulging out. Uh, so one just, you know, at this, the hinge of your jaw and one uh, almost halfway between the edge of your eyebrow and maybe your hair, hairline. Um, so when we want to assess someone's uh, trigeminal nerve function, we ask them to tense their jaw and then we palpate. So we kind of feel uh, these two regions, the master and the temporalis, to make sure the tone there is good. Um, the internal muscles are the lateral and medial uh, pterygoids. Um, you can't really palpate them, but they're also important to know. Um, the TMJ itself is pretty clinically relevant because um, a lot of people have what's termed TMJ disorders, which generally present with um, uh, pain, pain around the, the mouth and the, and the jaw, um, maybe difficulty eating, stuff like that. Um, it's actually the second most common cause of um, like mouth pain with the first being dental. Um, so it's yeah, pretty relevant. Again, if you're talking about this in, in an essay or whatever, very easy to just throw in TMJ disorders are an umbrella term for pain or dysfunction of the muscles of mastication and they're also very common. Uh, again, this is from Teach Me Anatomy, just showing um, how we divide the pharynx, which is basically, sorry, I keep saying this, but another fancy word for throat. Uh, so we have the nasopharynx, which is obviously where the uh, end of the nasal cavity joins the back of the mouth. So if you sniff, sometimes you can feel um, that's not going back along your throat. So uh, that's just going down the nasopharynx. Um, below that, you have the oropharynx, and that's just straight from the mouth um, to the back of the throat. Um, and then as the oropharynx descends, it becomes the uh, laryngeopharynx. And that's so called cool because it's where your larynx is, uh, your larynx being your voice box. So if we move on from the mouth, the next structural organ uh, relevant to the digestive tract is the esophagus. Um, it's simply a fibromuscular tube around 25 centimeters. Um, there are four layers of the esophageal wall. Um, which your syllabus does say uh, you should know. Uh, you have the mucosa uh, on the innermost side. So from the lumen going uh, outward, you have the mucosa uh, followed by the submucosa, followed by the muscularis propria. Sorry, that's spelt wrong. Uh, but that's basically the muscle layer which allows you know the peristalsis, that is the movement of food uh, triggered by smooth muscle contraction. Um, and then on the outermost side, you have the adventitia. The junction between the esophagus and the, and the stomach isn't really, isn't, it doesn't necessarily have a, a well-defined anatomical basis. So in other words, it's, it's, it's a bit difficult to see where, where that junction happens because the tissue is, becomes fairly similar. As we go down the esophagus, the tissue becomes uh, less, um, less like that in our mouth and more like that in our stomach. So it becomes, it, there's a transition from squamous to uh, glandular tissue. Um, it is clinically re relevant, however, because it's one of the most common sites of um, esophagogastric cancer. Um, so that's another little fact you could throw in if you are talking about the esophagus. Um, the physiology of the esophagus is mainly maintained by these two sphincters. Um, we have the lower esophageal sphincter there and you have the diaphragmatic sphincter. And they basically are closed uh, at rest. Um, and that is to prevent reflux of the contents of the stomach back up the throat. Um, so yeah, at rest they're, they're closed. When we eat, however, they relax so that food can go down um, and pass them that right way. So it's just a classic uh, example of um, sphincters ensuring one way flow. Um, Diurnal acid reflux is a very, very common condition. Um, one of the causes could be a failure of the sphincter to maintain its tone at rest, which just means that it kind of leaks acid or acidy contents up, up into your throat, uh, which itself is bad because that can predispose you to cancer. Um, 
if we look at the stomach itself now, you can see this uh, lower esophageal sphincter here um, is quite narrow. Um, but yeah, as I said, it should relax when we eat, so that food can can pass down. Um, the major sort of anatomical parts of the stomach, you have the fundus, which is just this kind of bit at the top, um, followed by the stomach, which makes up, uh, or sorry, the, the stomach body, which makes up the uh, major part of the stomach. Um, the cardia, which is the innermost aspect following the esophagus. Um, and um, apart from that, you have the pylorus. So the pylorus is at the tail end of the stomach. Uh, towards the direction of the duodenum um, and it is uh, quite relevant because um, there is a sphincter here the pyloric sphincter um, which is just another way to stop flow from the duodenum into the stomach um, and in, in some people uh, there's thickening of the sphincter um, either congenitally so it's a embryological issue or error that causes the thickening or it's some kind of reaction to conditions in utero which lead to uh, muscle hypertrophy uh, either way there's a narrowing here at birth which means that when you do uh, drink milk or give milk to your baby um, because there's outlet obstruction so that the milk or, or nutrients or whatever can't pass into the duodenum uh, generally what you'll see is the baby uh, projectile vomiting so it's quite a classic presentation of baby coming in with mum complaining of projectile vomiting um, following feeding um, and it's managed with surgery very successfully, actually. So the procedures to fix a pilot sphincter is very, um, very good and effective. But um, yeah, so that's uh, something about the pyloric sphincter. Uh, your syllabus also mentions the stomach and its relation to a mentor. Um, without getting too bogged down by this, the amenta are basically just folds in the peritoneum, um, like the the. Uh, lung pleura the peritoneum is a double membrane that lines the abdominal cavity so you have the parietal uh, peritoneum which is on the outside and the visceral which is the one that's directly adheres to the abdominal organs um but it's not necessary for you to know that um really um what you should know is that the lesser omentum is uh, the connection between the lesser curvature of the stomach so if i show you here we have the lesser curvature and the greater curvature. So lesser omentum connects the lesser curvature of the stomach to the liver, whereas the greater omentum uh, connects the greater curvature of the stomach, um, or, or rather it uh, extends from the greater curvature of the stomach across the small intestine and the traverse colon and kind of forms this kind of apronite structure. Uh, it has quite a lot of important functions because uh, it's quite fatty, it produces some um, different chemical signal, signaling things and stuff like that. But um, I'll show you here, it's a bit clearer. Uh, you see here, this lesser omentum is this fold and double fold in the membrane, which connects the lesser curvature of the stomach to the liver. Whereas the greater omentum is this, you might have seen images like this before and thought, well, what is this? Well, this is the greater omentum. It's just this fatty kind of sheet which covers covers the small intestine. Um, so again, it's quite important surgically because um, when you're making incisions in the abdominal wall, um, you're also needing to uh, divide the omentum if you need to access certain organs or move it out of the way and stuff like that. So I never used to really think about fat being involved with things, but yeah, the greater omentum is from the greater curvature of the stomach. Um, extends across the transverse colon here and completely obscures the small intestine. And then it folds back and connects up to the duodenum somewhere here, but you can't really see it. But yeah, takeaway, lesser curvature, uh, lesser omentum, lesser curvature to liver, greater omentum is the greater curvature and it extends across the transverse colon and the small intestine. I just put the slide in to kind of draw you to some definitions used at least in practice. Um, upper GI generally refers to uh, mouth, esophagus and stomach, whereas lower GI is from the duodenum downwards uh, to the rectum, but generally lower GI you might think first of the colon and rectum, um, but yeah upper, upper is mainly just esophagus and stomach, so now we'll discuss the lower. Uh, before we do so, I've got another question for you guys. Um, 
which of the following structures are retroperitoneal? So when I talked about the peritoneum, I mentioned it's a, the um, membrane that covers the abdominal cavity, but some of the structures in the abdomen sit behind that membrane and we call them retroperitoneal organs. Um, so there's a, um, so I'm just looking at answers here. Yeah, that's correct. So for those of you who don't have the Socrates, the options were stomach, duodenum, transverse colon, ileum, cecum. So the answer was cecum uh, because, oh, wait, no, no, sorry. The answer was duodenum. Cecum is uh, intraperitoneal, sorry. Um, the duodenum is actually the only one in that list that sits behind the retroperitoneum. And it's a bit of a tricky question, really, because actually D2 and D3, which I'll show you, um, are regions of the duodenum, and they're the ones that sit behind the peritoneum, whereas D1 and D2 are intraperitoneal. So a bit of a trick question there. So uh, no worries if you didn't get that. So moving on from the stomach, we have the duodenum here. Um, as I mentioned, it's D2 and 3, uh, which are retroperitoneal. Um, and the main functions of the duodenum are to neutralize gastric acid and introduce more digestive enzymes. So we'll break both of these points down. Um, here's the division of the duodenum. Um, you have D1, D2 descending, D3 kind of uh, flattening, out, flattening out a bit, and then D4 going upwards before it becomes the jejunum. So if you imagine D2 and D3 um, sit behind the peritoneum, so uh, sort of D1 pokes its way through the peritoneum becoming D2 and D3, and then D3 comes back into the peritoneum uh, before it becomes D4. So I've also got written here, the duct enters into duodenum, um, I should say D2. But yeah, here's, here's, a, here's another look. Um, so you have your uh, release of your bile and pancreatic juices uh, from these ducts here. Um, so this would be the um, uh, hepatic duct. This is the cystic duct. And when they combine, we call it the common bile duct. This comes down um, and joins this pancreatic duct, which contains the pancreatic enzymes, um, ultimately for all of these digestive enzymes to be released through um, an opening called the ampulla of vata, uh, which is here. Um, the opening of the ampulla of vata itself is controlled by another sphincter uh, here called the sphincter of body, which is just a kind of muscular valve, as all sphincters are, which kind of controls the flow of the digestive juices through that opening of vata. Um, so if we eat a meal, uh, we'll have signals being sent around, for example, cholecystokinin, uh, which will cause the gallbladder to squeeze to, to release, um, uh, you know, the, the bile to emulsify fats. Um, and you, you would also have the strength of ODI relaxing to allow the passage of these uh, enzymes into the duodenum to prepare for digestion. So, um, yeah, and this is in D2, not D3, um, which I hope you'd remember D1 is like here, D2 is this major descending portion, D3 is the lateral portion, and D4 uh, is flattens, uh, comes back up a bit, enters the peritoneum, and then becomes the uh, jejunum. So when we think about the duodenum compared to the jejunum and ileum, we can think about the differences in function. Uh, as we just saw with the, um, the ducts and the sphincters, um, the duodenum's major role is to uh, digest the food by introducing these digestive enzymes from the pancreas and bile duct, um, whereas the jejunum and ileum are more tasked with absorbing. Um, so because by this point, as food enters the, the jejunum, uh, a lot of the digestion has taken place. There will be some that happens in the jejunum, but by and large, um, this will be the site of absorption. Um, and as, as you might know, uh, some of the structures uh, microscopically uh, within these uh, two portions of the small intestine um, are the microvilli and, and villi, as well as mucosal folds, which just basically act to increase surface area to um, the maximum possible, really, 
to maximize how much nutrients are absorbed into our blood and then sent to the liver. Following the small intestine, we have the large bowel. Um, while we call it all the large bowel, there's actually a number of distinct regions with distinct structure and function, um, or I should say slightly different structures and slightly different functions, because as a whole, the large bowel's job is to squeeze out any remaining water and salts from the fibrous, undigested remains um, that have passed through the small intestine. Um, and then to produce feces. Um, so they all they all have that overall overarching function, but there are different properties between different parts of the colon, but I will spare you from that because um, we just want to get the, the basic knowledge for the part A's here. Um, you can see here, uh, this would be the, the terminal ileum. So if you remember, we have uh, jejunum, then we have ileum. As the ileum approaches its end, its terminus, uh, we have the terminal ileum, and then we have the uh, ileal cecal valve, which you can see better in this image here. Um, so this is quite an important site because uh, you have a lot of pathology that occurs at the terminal ileum. Um, you have, for example, uh, attacks of Crohn's disease occur here. You can have something called terminal ileitis uh, for other reasons, infection, things like that. Um, and this valve is also important because it ensures, as we saw with the sphincters we've discussed already, uh, a one-way flow. We don't want backflow. Uh, the whole point of this digestive system is to get from mouth uh, to anus and then squeeze every every uh, nutrient drop um, on the way. Um, so yeah, this is this is just another valve to stop backflow. Um, we have the ascending uh, colon, which is on your right-hand side. Um, we, we, as that uh, turns into the transverse colon, we have this uh, right colic flexure, which is really called the hepatic flexure, because if you think about it, the liver is sitting just above on your right side. Um, as we go across the transverse colon, there's another flexure here, left colic flexure, but in reality, splenic flexure, flexure because we have the spleen sitting just above um, uh, this side on your left. We then have the descending colon on your left, followed by the sigmoid, which is a floppy part of your large bowel, um, which ultimately acts as the bridge between the descending um, and the descending colon and the rectum, um, which obviously then passes out to the anus. Um, I don't know what to say here. The, um, the ascending and descending colon are both uh, intraperitoneal Oh, sorry, they're both uh, retroperitoneal structures, um, but the transverse is intraperitoneal. So that's another thing to think about. You have this whole organ uh, def defined a lot of the time as one thing, but actually there's a lot of different uh, courses and different compartments that its uh, components sit in, uh, which is worth thinking about. Uh, your syllabus mentions is appendicitis, which is very common as well, uh, presents with a right iliac fossa pain, uh, so basically pain on your right hip. Um, mostly, uh, well, it simply describes inflammation of the appendix, which is just this kind of uh, worm-like extension from the cecum. Um, and that usually happens because a fecal lip or a small lump of fecal matter blocks the entrance to the appendix. Um, and as that entrance becomes blocked, uh, you can have uh, inflammation or irritation of the, um, of the appendix wall. Um, and that itself can lead to the symptoms that you see, which is, yeah, pain, pain in your right hip. Um, generally, you, you'll be uh, treated with a appendectomy, which is just you cut it out, usually laparoscopically, so through keyhole ports with cameras. Um, but yeah, the risk of appendicitis, obviously, if you don't fix it soon enough, or it's particularly bad uh, because inflammation makes tissue a lot floppier and. Uh, less uh, inte removes integrity, um, untreated appendicitis can lead to rupture um, and perforation, uh, which would lead to more widespread, widespread inflammation um, and infection, potentially even abscess in your abdominal cavity. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of pathology that goes on in the small and large bowel. Uh, I won't talk about all of it, but I just wanted to direct your attention to some of the more common pathologies if you want to learn some examples for um for your essay um 
but yeah, you'll, you'll get the slides. So yeah, this is more just to direct you. Um, blood supply to the GI tract is, uh, it's a bit tricky, but I think if you land this, this descending aorta diagram, you should be uh, in a much better position. Um, mainly the GI tract is supplied by the celiac, uh, the SMA and the IMA. Um, which we'll break down now. But yeah, just remember the three uh, offshoots of the ab abdominal aorta that come from the front are the celiac first, superior mesenteric artery second, and then the inferior last. The celiac trunk is the probably the most complicated. Um, one fact to remember about it if you don't learn the anatomy is that it supplies the foregut derivatives. If we just think of foregut as the one, the, the part of the GI tract that occurs earlier on. So uh, that's the stomach, the spleen, liver and gallbladder, uh, the proximal duodenum, abdominal esophagus and the pancreas. Um, there are three branches, the common hepatic, left gastric and splenic, um, and it originates from T12. Um, so I've just got some pictures here again, teach me anatomy, coming as a hero. Um, you have the celiac trunk here. Um, you have one artery going to the right, and this is the common hepatic and then you have two coming to the left. One is the left gastric, which supplies the uh, lesser curvature of the stomach, along with uh, the right gastric artery, which comes as a branch of the um, common hepatic. So the right gastric comes from the common hepatic, connects with the left gastric artery, which comes from the uh, celiac trunk directly. Other than that, you have the splenic artery, which goes behind the can supplies the spleen on this side here. It also supplies the uh, greater curvature of the stomach via the um, left uh, gastroepiploic artery, um, which just like the, curve, the lesser curv curvature, um, also anastomoses with the right gastroepiploic, which itself comes from the descending gastroduodenal artery, uh, which is a branch of the common hepatic. Um, now, yeah, I don't know if you, if you don't know this anatomy, it's just sounding like I'm listing things to you. Um, and it is kind of like that with this uh, celiac trunk thing. You just kind of got to learn it. And um, I've put a link to a, a video here, which shows some guy uh, drawing through it, which is very helpful. So if you are confused or, or particularly want to learn your celiac trunk anatomy, I would recommend you uh, watch that video. So after the celiac trunk, we have the superior mesenteric artery, much simpler, I think, in terms of its supply. Um, generally, it supplies the midgut, which uh, includes the small intestine, the cecum, um, the ascending and part of the transverse colon. And all of the arteries that supply these parts are named after the part they supply, which is always helpful. So you have the jejunum and the ileum supplied by the jejunal and ileal branches of the SMA. You have the ileocolic artery, which is going to supply, obviously, that uh, the boundary between the uh, ileum and the, the cecum. Um, then you have the right ar the colic artery supplying the ascending colon and the middle, which supplies part of that transverse um, and that originates at L1. Similarly, you have the IMA, which supplies the hindgut, um, which is basically everything that's left over. So rectum, sigmoid, descending colon, and the uh, distal third of the transverse colon. Again, everything's named after what it's supplying, so that's helpful. Um, yeah, this is just a slide showing the foregut, midgut, and hindgut for you to look at. Um, all blood from the GI tract drains into the liver by the hepatic portal vein. Uh, so again, fairly simple. Everything's going back to, to the liver via uh, a branch that's named after the organ itself. Um, so again, if you if you want to learn all of the names of these branches, you can you can do that. But um, I think the general gist is that everything is going eventually to the portal vein, which delivers that nutrient rich GI blood into the, the, the liver. Um, it's called a portal vein because it's not a true vein. Uh, a true vein is one that carries blood back to the heart, um, which this doesn't. Uh, the importance of the portal vein is that it allows the liver to, um, you know, use the nutrients to create metabolic substrates and build things up, which is one of the liver's major roles. Equally, it allows the liver to break down any toxins that have, might have been introduced to the body. It's the, it's, the liver's kind of like the first real uh, uh, metabolic barrier, let's say, 
uh, for anything coming into our body. So it's, it's quite an important system to, to know a bit about. Okay, so I'm aware we're five minutes to eight, but I'm gonna try and get through urogenital anatomy with you guys. Sorry, it's been very fast, but um, I hope I'm covering the basics and you know enough of this just to be jogging your memory. Um, right, so let's start with the perineum. Um, generally, more colloquially, the perineum is just described as that space between um, your genitals and your anus. Uh, but anatomically, it's more defined by this kind of diamond. So um, it's made up of the uh, urogenital and anal triangle. Um, the urogenital triangle is bordered by the ischiopubic rami and sacro tuberous ligament, with the anterior border being the pubic symphysis, whereas the inferior border um, that is the point on the anal triangle is defined by the tip of the coccyx. Um, you can also think about the surface borders here as well. Um, but yeah, basically just it's this diamond shape involving urogenital and anal triangle with pubis symphysis at the front and the coccyx at the back. Um, in the interest of time, we'll skip the question, but well, I'll just tell you, uh, which of the following is a pelvic floor muscle and what nerve root innervates it? Uh, the answer to this was the levator, levator ani muscle group uh, is the major uh, component of the pelvic floor muscles and it's innervated by um, the anterior rami of S4 as well as the internal pudendal nerve which itself is uh, originates from S2, 3 and 4. So the answer would be S2, 3 and 4. Uh, the pelvic floor is a funnel shape uh, structure uh, which separates the pelvic cavity from the perineum um, as I said the, lev the levator ani is the largest muscle component um, so you can see here the pelvic floor is formed by the levator ani as well as the coccygeus and generally these are muscle groups so there's a number of muscles that are levator ani muscles but um, I think for this purpose we'll just keep it simple like that um, you can see the lateral wall of the pelvic floor is formed by the obturator internus and the piriformis. So again, just something to memorize because it could easily come up in part A's. Um, this is just a picture showing the um, perineum again. You can see that in a woman it's a bit wider, um, obviously for childbearing reasons. I'm sure you might have seen the side-on view of uh, these structures in a pro section. So um, it might come up in your exams that they have this like in a real person with, with it dissected. Um, and it can be a bit tricky, but if you just remember this basic relations of the uh, organs in this cartoon, I think you will be okay. Um, obviously the major difference between the male and the female is the uterus, uh, which forces the bladder slightly forward and down. Um, but yeah, the um, these are just relations to, to kind of learn. So the perineum itself is supplied by the pudendal nerve um, and the internal pudendal artery and vein. Um, they reach the perineum via a canal called Al Alcott's Canal, um, which runs across the uh, inner aspect of the uh, ischial tuber tuberosity. Um, and it gives branches to the anal and urogenital triangles. In other words, it supplies the whole perineum. Um, it's less useful. Here is a good picture which shows uh, these are this is S2, 3 and 4 um, coming together to eventually give off the pudendal nerve or the internal pudendal nerve, I should say, um, which groups with the internal pudendal artery and vein along this edge of the pubic bone. Um, which is called pudendal canal, and then that will extend to give off branches to the urogenital and anal triangles. The pelvic splanchic nerves are also relevant here because um, they are the parasympathetic um, innervation of the um, sort of pelvis, uh, which includes the bladder, uh, perineum, and also the sexual organs. Um, given that it's, it makes sense that the functions of the pelvic splanchic nerves are to regulate emptying of the urinary bladder, control opening and closure of the internal urethral sphincter, and give uh, motility to the rectum. Um, as I said, it's also important for sexual function, uh, like erection and things like that. 
Um, two examples of things that can happen if these nerves are damaged are neurogenic bladder dysfunction. So that's when you have problems um, peeing or problems storing pee, etc. Uh, not because of any innate issue with the bladder tissue or muscle itself, but because the nerve supplying it is, is playing up for whatever reason. Uh, fecal incontinence is simply constipation, again, because of nerve damage rather than intrinsic damage to the rectal muscles. Um, and yeah, that would require a neurologist intervention. Right, coming up to the end here, um, but about kidneys, bilateral bean-shaped organs on either side of the spine, uh, generally they're quite recognisable in pictures they might give you, so that's a good thing. Um, the left kidney is slightly higher up than the right kidney, which makes sense because we have this big liver pushing everything down on the right side. Um, they generally extend between T12 and L3, uh, but that can vary between individuals. Um, and another asymmetry between the two is the courses of the renal veins and arteries. As you can see here, the IVC is on the right side, whereas the aorta is slightly on the left side. So the course of the aorta to the left kidney is going to be shorter. Sorry, the course of the renal artery to the left kidney is going to be shorter uh, than its course to the left. Um, whereas the IVC is going to have a shorter course to the right kidney than it is to the left because it's nearer to that side. Again, relevant for surgery. Um, I'm not, not really sure how else it would be relevant, but it's something they could ask you. Basic structure of the kidney, you have the um, cortex and the medulla. Uh, so the cortex on the outside and the medulla on the mid inside. Both have different functions in terms of uh, what they produce um, and also in terms of uh, what function they have in an overall um, fluid balance. Obviously this is an anatomy lecture so I'll, I'll not go into the physiology too much but yeah just think about cortex is on the outside which I always thought was strange because cortex core middle but no it's the opposite so if that helps you remember then just say it's the opposite to what you think. Um, obviously when you get to the cortex you have the structure of the nephron so um, the renal veins becoming arterioles and capillaries uh, interacting with the, the Bowman's capsule and the actual nephron itself, where exchange happens. Um, the medulla concentrates the uh, urine, essentially, um, and ext uh, extracts any um, useful nutrients. Uh, in the middle, you have the renal pelvis, which is kind of where the urine drains, uh, which eventually passes through to the ureter. Uh, the ureters, just like the esophagus, fibromuscular tubes, they drain the kidneys of urine. Um, they are retroperitoneal, so they sit behind the, um, the peritoneum. Um, but way to think or remember that is, um, well, I guess people with, with kidney pain always complain of loin pain. Um, so loin pain being around the back of your, um, of your sides rather than the front. Um, the upper half uh, is in the upper half of the ureter is in the um, uh, abdomen, whereas the lower half is in the pelvis. So I should say the kidneys are retroperitoneal as well as the ureters, which obviously makes sense because they're direct connections of each other. Um, as you can see down here, the angle of the ureter into the bladder is quite um, oblique, um, and that's so that uh, there's less chance that urine is going to go back the wrong way. So again, a theme of this digestive tract is everything is going one way. Um, so what can we do to ensure uh, the digestive tract and any kind of tract in our body is things go one way. Generally, we don't like two-way transport of um, excretory products. This is the bladder, um, hollow, muscular and distensible elastic organ. Obviously, it needs to be elastic and distensible because increases in size as the volume of urine and it increases to an extent. Um, the trigone is a, probably the only relevant bit of it that you need to know, um, which is basically this kind of smooth triangular area uh, defined by the left and right ureteric orifices. So as the ureters come into the bladder, they have these small holes um, and the uh, internal urethral um, sphincter or, or just the urethra opening anyway in general. Um, so it's kind of this, this triangle between them. Um, generally, when we pee, um, there's a lot of nervous input, obviously, uh, but the 
uh, end result of neuronal control is that when the bladder is um, when the bladder is filling up, uh, so say let's start from two. Uh, when the when the bladder is filling up, we're stretching its walls, which is giving signals um, that it's filling up, uh, which leads to um, an urge to pee. But we can voluntarily inhibit that, which I'll mention in a second. Um, in which case, the bladder would continue to to fill up. Um, at this point, the um, we need to pee again and even more, um, and so when we decide we're in the right place to do that, to avoid our bladder, um, our detrusor muscle, uh, which is on the uh, periphery of the bladder, uh, contracts, it squeezes, um, which in, 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 uh, in line with the behavior of the sphincters uh, allows the passage of urine outwards into the uh, well toilet, I hope. Um, and then we have a relaxed detrusor muscle as the bladder is uh, near empty. So yeah, the final question which you can think about, but I'll answer for you, is uh, how are we able to voluntarily stop urinary flow when the bladder is more than half full? So if we look at uh, number two, what is it that that allows us to know that we could pee but we 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 don't? Um, the answer is all in sphincters. Um, there are two urethral sphincters. You have the involuntary internal urethral sphincter. Um, so that's obviously the one higher up. So I've got a picture in the next slide. Um, and you have the voluntary external urethral sphincter. Um, and that surrounds the membranous part of the urethra. Um, at rest, and, and when we don't need to be, there's not any urine in our bladder, um, they're both closed. Um, and they are only both open when we are avoiding. So when our bladder is full and we've decided we can, uh, we can void. Um, it's because the external urethral sphincter is voluntary uh, rather than under the parasympathetic control of the internal sphincter, um, we can stop ourselves from peeing even if our um, innate body decides it's time. We can sort of override that with our external sphincter and that's basically how we stop ourselves from peeing even after the bladder wall is stretched and the the chooser is trying to contract and the internal sphincter is open. And yeah, that is the end.